Hello, I'm Dr. Janet Sumner. I'm a scientist, but I'm not a biologist. So I'm joining Dr. Rob Saunders in the School of Life, Health and Chemical Sciences for a tour of one of the labs. In this short film, we're bringing you a unique 360 degree immersive experience. So take a minute now to have a look around and see what you can see. Right, Rob, where are we going to start? Well, we've chosen this lab because it's in, in many ways the hub for what we do in the department, this kind of laboratory. And this is a, a laboratory which is open plan, as you can see, uh, and ordinarily houses uh, members of several research groups doing basic biochemical and molecular genetic research. So much of the material that we work on here comes in from elsewhere in the department, from other laboratories, for example, cell culture laboratories, right. which you can find out a bit more elsewhere on the website. The material comes in and uh, really, I, I suppose it's fair to say that a lot of what we do is, it involves the analysis of specific biomolecules. So the first thing that happens is you might want to be uh, fractionating your sample to mm -hmm. separate different cellular components. And for that, you would typically be using facilities such as this, which is uh, a set of uh, different centrifuges. Right. So the centrifuges separate biological particles and materials on the basis of fragment size and, and density. And Is that why you've got different sizes of centrifuges yes, then? Yes, that's right. So th some of these things, th these things will operate at different speeds. So the higher speed will be for separating smaller, uh, less dense yeah. fragments. The, the, the individual rotors, you can see in, on, on the bench there a purple rotor, which is a moderately sized volumes of samples. And the big black rotor at the back how is it, would, would hold large, uh, large tubes that you might be separating, uh, pelleting cells from a large cell culture experiment. Why would you need a kind of big bucket of stuff? Well, uh, f depends what it is you're looking for. If what you're looking for is quite rare in the sample, yeah. you're going to grow up a lot of cells to get it. Uh, if you're doing something like separating DNA from uh, bacterial cells, typically you're growing those in half-litre cultures. So mm -hmm. it's quite large volumes. Yeah. Okay. So as I said earlier, uh, the, the laboratory is used by members of several different research groups but all of their activities really use very similar uh, basic laboratory equipment. And this is a, a typical bay uh, from one of these, uh, for one of these research labs with lots of little pieces of, uh, of kit dotted about. And you know, this, this stuff ranges from the, the whirly mixes for mixing up your samples, it makes a, a rather good uh, <laughs> nice sound whirring, effect. whirring noise, <laughs> yes, um, to smaller centrifuges. So this is really a very small scale version of what we saw in, yeah. in, in that room there and this would be used for separating um, s very small samples in small one and a half milliliter uh, plastic tubes. Right that's the and things that you see the people pipetting things into That's right so that's tubes such as, as, as these and uh, you'd be adding small volumes of liquid from, from uh, small handheld pipettes there. Okay. And down at the end we've got uh, a variety of heating blocks so a lot of what we do involves incubation of samples at different temperatures often because there's an enzyme involved so mm -hmm. many of the enzymes we use operate at 37 degrees which is standard body, body temperature. temperature but sometimes not sometimes lower temperatures and of particular note are, are we have an, a large number of these uh, these machines which are polymerase chain reaction machines so polymerase chain reaction or PCR, PCR. is uh, a, a, a very important technique in modern biology. It enables you to amplify very small amounts of DNA into the quantities of DNA that you're able to analyze um, right. by the kind of techniques we'll sh I'll show you in I the next bay. I figured it had got something to do with DNA. Yes, well, it has <laughs> got a, a bit of a big clue on here. But this is, this is a really important technique. It's the sort of thing we use in the fly lab for uh, identifying which mutations are present in our, our flies. Right. Uh, you would use it for seeing if particular oncogenes are mutant in a, a tumour sample. So we're talking cancers. We're talking cancer research. Yeah. And, you know, in, in external laboratories, it, it's a, a, a very important technique in forensic biology if you're trying to track down the, the origin of a, a hair sample at a crime scene, for example. Right. That's how you do your DNA fingerprinting. Should have worn my hair net. Yes. <laughs> um, so uh, I've, I've, uh, I've mentioned that what we really look at here are a variety of biological molecules and we separate bi biological molecules by gel electrophoresis in, in many cases and, and that's either using uh, agarose gels 
for DNA, and you'll see one of those in just a minute. But also, uh, we separate proteins on, on a different kind of gel matrix. And essentially, what you do here is you apply your mixture of, of biological molecules at one end of a gel matrix and pass an electric current across. And right. you separate the molecules on the basis of their size and possibly their charge, depending on how you're doing oh, right, the yeah. experiment. So obviously, you've got a mixture of, of biological material in that sample. And so that's stuff you're interested stuff in and you're stuff interested you're not in. interested yes, exactly in. exactly it. Right. And so what, one of the ways that we can do this is to use um, radioactive tracers. You can specifically label molecules with uh, low-level low radioactivity. And we have a, right. an area in this lab which is uh, closed off, obviously, because you need to have it contained away from general yeah. laboratory activity. But typically, you can spot your biological material by exposing your gel to a, a piece of X-ray film, and the radioactivity causes the X-ray film to darken. That's, that's the, uh, uh, but in brief. Of course, more recently, and more powerfully, I think, you can recognize specific protein molecules uh, by using antibodies, which are, uh, are, are proteins derived from the, from, uh, the mammalian immune system. Yeah. Um, so these things recognize specific regions of a characteristic regions of a protein, so you can unambiguously identify yeah. a protein within the mix. And safer as well. Yes, safer as well, uh, because you're not dealing with radioactivity. Yeah. It's less hassle in the bureaucracy as well, yeah. I have to say. Um, uh, here we've got one, of, one such, uh, an example of a, a kit for gel electrophoresis. Uh, this is a, a medium-sized agarose gel, so it's horizontal. You've, you can just see the gel matrix as this milky-coloured slab yeah, like, in, it's like an agar plate. Yes, it's, it's, it's really chemically it's the same, but it's hi a higher degree of purity. You need to, you, oftentimes you have to extract DNA from a gel like this for further analysis, so it needs to be quite pure matrix. And it's in a tank which is filled with a conductive liquid buffer, which allows the electric, electric current to be uh, transmitted through the gel. Okay. Um, so you'd be typically be using that to look at the outcome of a, a polymerase chain reaction Right, so it's come from over, over there, there come to from here. Over there and you'd be looking at it on here. And gel, uh, agarose gels come in a whole variety of sizes. That's quite a large one. And this is the gel plate, which is uh, quite a bit smaller, as you can see. Yeah. So this would be the sort of thing you would use in a very quick, an quick analysis if you wanted to see if anything had come out in your, in right. your PCR reaction. So what kind of things are you looking for on the gel plates then? Well, typically, for example, from the PCR, you'd be looking to see, well, A, did the polymerase chain reaction actually work? Have you got anything to see? Yeah. Uh, and secondly, uh, have you got the DNA fragment that you would be expecting to see? Is it there? Is it there in the right quantities? Is it the right size? That's right. the sort of thing you're looking at. Uh, you visualize the, the, the DNA by staining with a fluorescent dye, which shows up, uh, glows orange under ultraviolet. So you need the right amount of DNA to get the to, signal. To be able to see if you've got yeah. anything there. There's very, you know, we, we've all done experiments where you've not had enough sample to, to, to see what it is you're trying to see. And what, you can use a, a, a device like this, which measures the absorbance of ultraviolet light in your biological sample. So you can see, has your solution got enough DNA? Have you got enough DNA there? Is it worth actually, carrying is on? Is it worth carrying on? Yeah, mm. or do you go back to square one? Yeah. Similarly, you can use it for assessing the amount of protein present. Yeah. And then finally, down in, in, in this bay, we have a, there's a, just a, a, again, it's a number of, of standard laboratory uh, pieces of kit. So we have the usual uh, fridges, freezers, and uh, very low uh, temperature freezers here. So this one's more, of, more like a domestic freezer. It goes down to minus 20. That's kind of what you'd be storing your pork chops in at home. Right, okay. This thing's minus 80 degrees, which is quite a lot colder, and a lot of, a lot of, you would use this for long-term storage of, right. of materials. For, for storing living cells frozen, you'd be using liquid nitrogen, which we don't keep in the main lab, because right. it's, it's, you know, it's, it's continually evaporating, of course. Of course we, have, yeah. we have a separate lab, lab So when that. you say long-term storage, what could you keep in there and for how long? You could keep frozen bacterial samples alive in there indefinitely. Uh, you could keep DNA samples in there indefinitely. DNA is a very stable molecule. That's why it's useful for forensics. Yeah. Actually, if you've got it in the right uh, pH, the right buffer, it will last for a long, long time. Yeah. But this bay here also uh, it has the sort of stuff you would have for your initial analyses. We've got um, uh, stereo microscopes for doing dissections of starting material if you're right. working with animal tissues, for example. 
Um, and the gel kits, the usual thing. So that's a, that's a, a brief <laughs> a whistle-stop tour of a, of a molecular biology laboratory. It's, in many ways, as I say, it's the, it's the hub of what we do in, in, in the laboratory. We've got a lot of other specific facilities, which right. you can find out a lot more about by looking elsewhere on the school website. Rob, it's been fascinating. Thanks very much for giving us the yeah. tour. Oh, I hope you find it interesting.